Feuer! Nerderotic.com I have seen the third episode of The Rings of Power. We are almost halfway through the first season. Have things improved? Absolutely not. I think they've actually gotten worse. Please cue Peter Jackson. We didn't want to put any of our own baggage. I mean, we had no interest in putting our messages in, into this movie, but we thought that we should honor Tolkien by putting his messages into it. It's been a week since the premiere of the first two episodes of The Rings of Power. Let's see how Amazon and their willing and able access media partners that they completely control have reacted to the criticism. Let's start with Amazon Prime Video, which wouldn't allow anyone to leave a review for over five days, and at the time of recording, you still can't see an accurate count. IMDB, which is owned by Amazon, has been caught removing reviews. And this is out of the norm. Rotten Tomatoes is just letting things ride. Maybe it has something to do with Warner Brothers owning 25%. But according to Amazon, 25 million people sampled the rings of power in the first 24 hours whatever that means which doesn't really line up with what samba tv reported now to be fair this is only through streaming televisions things like roku they reported that the premiere episode of the rings of power was only watched by 1.8 million people over four days and the second episode was only watched by 1.3 that means over 25 percent of the audience dipped out when all they had to do was click to see the next episode and for everyone who asks how do you know it's bad you haven't seen it yet fair enough question i guess for those of you who haven't been paying attention to star wars star trek doctor who marvel comics dc comics and pop culture in general and let's just ignore the fact that all the fans concerns and speculations ended up being absolutely right we can now judge the show on its merits its writing its acting its presentation its execution and it has executed Tolkien. And what is Amazon's and the access media that they control's response? Same as it ever was. The Rings of Power is suffering a racist backlash for casting actors of color, but Tolkien's work has always attracted white supremacists. Racist Rings of Power backlash is more of the same replacement theory fear-mongering. A racist backlash to the Rings of Power puts Tolkien's legacy into focus. Then, right on cue, Amazon takes a page out of the Ghostbusters 2016 and Disney Star Wars playbook by claiming that the castmates of color, how about just castmates, are receiving harassment and threats, which of course nobody should do, but they haven't provided a single receipt. This reminds me of something. Oh yes, Moses Ingram with Obi-Wan Kenobi. And to be fair, she did provide receipts, three of them. That was followed up by a Yuma McGregor video, and this one was followed up with Hobbits selling a t-shirt where half of the profits will supposedly go to some charity that's not really named, and the other half will go in someone's pocket. No, I'm not sure about that one. I don't know if that checks out. That's what I call a grift. This is all conflation to protect a brand and a giant corporation, and they are perfectly willing to use their castmates of color as a shield, which is reprehensible. And it's all meant to silence legitimate criticism based on the show from yours truly and you. With that, let's get on with the criticism. We start with Don Lemon last getting caught by the very white orcs and getting immediately chained by the ankle. Nothing says Tolkien like allegorical symbolism. The very white orc mentions Adar, which also happens to be the name of this episode. I wonder if we're going to meet him later. Meanwhile, on the second boat, Guy Ladriel and Sauron, sorry, Halbrand just randomly came across on the ocean. Our insufferable main character wakes up clothed and fed and continues to act insufferable. Then we are finally introduced to Elendil and what the hell is that on his chest? Ladies and gentlemen, we have Moob Armor. Totally Not Sauron asks where they're going and Elendil waits to answer for dramatic effect. We are indeed at the doomed island kingdom of Numenor and sure, this show has had some nice establishing shots, some broad sweeping landscapes that lead directly into boring exposition and contrived events. Guy Ladriel insinuates that they might find out why things are strange between the Numenorians and the elves. Uh, we don't. I guess this is a good time to point out that Guy Ladriel is short. Totally not Sauron stops to look at a forge. Subtle. Just in case you weren't sure we were in Numenor, we're told one more time. Patience, patience. We are men and women of Numenor. Once again, Guy Ladriel is taken to the manager, and this time it's 
Queen Regent Muriel, and then we get dueling female empowerment. Queen Regent Muriel, who we'll get to in just a moment, asks Guy Ladriel her name, and she gets her Khaleesi moment. After some more forced dialogue to show that we're dealing with two very powerful women here that just end up sounding annoying, so annoying, it takes Sauron, I'm sorry, Halbrand, to calm things down. During the ladies' pissing match, Karl Marx Farazon mentions that elves have not been allowed on the shores of Numenor for generations. Now let's take a brief moment to talk about Numenor, Queen Regent Muriel, Farazon, and potential spoilers from the books, which might not be spoilers at all considering once again that this show has taken Tolkien's lore and reduced it to Easter eggs. Numenor is Tolkien's Atlantis mixed in with some Sodom and Gomorrah and possibly Noah's Flood. Numenorians were very tall, they lived hundreds of years, that's who Aragorn was descended from. In the beginning their island was prosperous, but then there was a split between the Kingsmen and the faithful. The faithful remained faithful to the Valar. The Kingsmen were jealous of the elves' immortality. Now, in the context of the show, they give us a couple of little hints. Things start really going bad towards the end during the time of Farazhan and Muriel. I'm not even finished with this episode, and at this point, I have to ask who in the hell this show is for? Normies aren't going to know what's going on because everything is moving at a snail's pace with very little information and book fans are going to be pissed because all the actual lore that exists in the books that's been put in this show would fit into your average TikTok video. And let's talk about Queen Regent Muriel, who never was a Queen Regent and never met Galadriel. Sure, she was around during the fall of Numenor, but there's the little problem of her being born 1,617 years after the forging of the Rings of Power. Out of the 25 rulers of Numenor, three being women, they decided to choose Muriel. Why? The reason? Ideology. It really reflects what a Kingsman would do. Turn their back on the source, Tolkien, and pray at the altar of agenda. I guess it's also so it could pass the Bechdel test. Later on in the series, Guy Ladriel and Muriel go into battle together and get their Thelma and Louise moment. Then we finally get a chance to meet Asildur, the man who cut the ring from Sauron's hand. This is a younger version who has his head in the clouds. How do I know? Well, there's a scene where they show him not paying attention, and then someone says he always has his head in the clouds. Your mind was in the bleeding clouds again all day. What is it? Just eager to get out there. We also meet his completely invented sister, but the most important thing we learn from this scene is the sea is always right. We're supposed to believe that Queen Regent Muriel here is trying to accuse Asildur's father, Alindil, of treason. And are you an elf friend? Motherfucker, what makes you think I care? Remember that great line of dialogue, why do ships float when a stone cannot? They loved it so much they called back on it. Well, they did it again. It was the sea that put her in my path. The sea is always right! The sea is always right! And the sea is always right. The sea cannot commit treason. You gotta be fucking kidding. Obviously, Muriel has an ulterior motive, and she tasks Elindil to watch over Galadriel, and then she hands him a sword, and that better not be Narsil. We're back to Don Lemonless, and... Thank God he tells us that the orcs are digging the tunnels to avoid detection and avoid sunlight because I wouldn't have figured that out. This must be how they escaped our detection and how they shield themselves from sunlight. Guess who's coming to second breakfast is imprisoned with his regiment of elves and let's talk about them for just a moment. They don't look like elves. They just look like dudes. There's nothing ethereal or special about them at all. They look like witcher elves. The very bland elves refuse to cut down a tree that's in the way of a giant trench that they're supposed to dig. The very white orcs get angry and then offer them some water. Is this a trap? Of course it's a trap. And then Erendir's friend, you know, the one we all figured was dead meat, dies. Looks like meat's back on the menu, boys! <laughs> While the bland elf and the very white orcs are arguing, Don Lemonless offers to cut down the tree, and this scene reminds me of something. I will take the ring to Mordor. <laughs> I will cut it down! As Guess Who's Coming to Eleven's Ease is cutting down the tree, we get a good look at the landscape and the size of the trench and what's covering it. Where in the hell did the very white orcs get all that fabric? And how in the hell did the elves miss this? Everlas, what do your elf eyes see? A big ass trench! We can't go very long without the insufferable Gail Adriel, who dials it up a little bit in this scene. She escapes her confinement and then very kindly gets confronted by Alindiel, and she threatens to murder him. I will take my chances on the skiff. 
It would leave me little choice but to shout for your minders. Suppose the words never managed to escape your throat. After more insufferable dialogue from an intolerable character. Anywhere is better than here, where I'm hated by all who see me. Yup! We find out that Elendil is a friend of elves, and they talk about a hall of lore. That's convenient, but before we get to that, we need to talk about Guy Ladriel. We're almost three episodes in, and aside from all the other problems, I would say the biggest one is the main character, the one they centered this entire show around, one of the most popular characters from the secondary world. If you haven't watched the show, we're not underselling this. She is completely unlikable. If you have watched the show, she's probably the reason you stopped watching. And it looks like Amazon might be aware of this. Oh, look, a well-timed Hollywood Reporter article from September 9th. Rings of Power star Morphid Clark on how humility will play a big part in Galadriel's evolution. In other words, please stay with us. She's on a character arc. It's never a good sign when you have to justify creatively bankrupt decisions in the access media. Spoilers, there is no character arc. Not this season, anyway. Guy Ladriel and Elendil go on a horsey ride to the Hall of Lore, and what the hell? She really likes that horse. What the hell is even that? They finally make it to the Hall of Lore, and Galadriel... The warrior of the wastelands, the commander of Gilgalad's northern armies, finally looks at a map and figures out that the mark of Sauron is Mordor. But that's not all. Here in the Hall of Lore, the lore masters seem to miss something kind of important. What is this? The account of a human spy retrieved from an enemy dungeon. He drew this to record the tower's location. It speaks not only of a place, but a plan. Plan by which to create a realm of their own where evil would not only endure but thrive. You mean to tell me that the lore masters of the Hall of Lore just so happen to have a piece of parchment that has Sauron's plan B? <laughs> That's been there for what, decades? Centuries? And they missed it? As much as this episode drags, the last half is excruciating. The good news is not much happens. Now, Sauron, sorry, Halbrand wants to forge steel. I wonder why. But you're not allowed to forge steel in Numenor unless you have a guild badge. But as Shad Brooks pointed out, how in the hell can you learn to forge steel if you're not allowed to until you get a guild badge? Well, Totally Not Sauron fails at stealing a guild badge from some guys that he avoided a fight with and made friends with and then got into a fight with and almost killed a couple of them. He goes to Numenorean jail and this part was just unavoidable. On to the Harfoots. No, we don't learn very much. The Harfoots that we can't call hobbits are about to go on their migration. Hobo Baggins talks about female Frodo again. And we got Nori. No. Look, once that girl puts her head to something, nothing can stop her. Just in case you didn't catch how free-spirited she was the first seven or eight times. I guess you're not supposed to go off trail or walk alone. I know this because it's in a chant they repeat multiple times. Nothing happens. The constellation, not Gandalf, showed female Frodo and female Sand comes up again, but we're no closer to figuring out where it takes us. The Harfoots finally figure out that female Frodo is hiding, not Gandalf. Female Frodo almost gets de caravan and they all get in trouble when the whole family gets put to the back of the line. But not to worry, not Gandalf helps them, so they don't fall behind but why were they worried so much well this is where we find out the most pertinent information about the harfoots they're assholes because if you fall behind they're just gonna leave you sure they'll have a ceremony later and feel real bad about it but they'll still leave you to die this is followed by a useless scene to show that there is some forced drama in a Lindiel's family but we do get the single most cringe line of dialogue in this episode turns out a sildur is a fanboy of galadriel the galadriel Scourge of the Orcs. Never mind what she's the scourge of. Not just the warrior of the northern wastelands. Not just the commander of the northern armies. Now Guy Ladriel is the scourge of the Orcs. Oh, and a Sildur's completely made up sister whose name I won't even bother to remember got accepted into the University of Numenor. And remember, Amazon created a Sildur's sister to bring a female energy to the family. Guy Ladriel goes to visit Totally Not Sauron in Numenorean jail and she figured out that he's actually the king of the southern people based on the pendant he's wearing. He's the anti-Aragorn. Totally subverting our 
expectations. That's right, the Amazon created Halbrand, who was basically Aragorn, is gonna end up being Sauron f*** this show. And because Guy Ladriel's been reduced to the girl who's the key to everything, we have one more scene with Queen Regent Muriel, and who I assume is Tar Plantier, her dad, saying that the elf has arrived the moment we feared. That's what we were all thinking around the beginning of the first episode of this series. The end of Arda shows Amazon doing their best Zack Snyder impression with the failed escape of Don Lemonless, where all that ended up happening was all the white elves were killed by a warg. The very white orcs take Guess Who's Coming to Second Breakfast to their leader, the namesake of this episode, Arda, and we don't get to see him. And now we know why Amazon's hitting the panic button. This episode had the same problem as the previous episode. And the first episode, the main character is insufferable and it's boring. And as I believe I mentioned in multiple previous videos, Amazon will try to spin that it's our fault. Far be it for me to completely destroy Amazon and the Access Media's false narrative, but let me get this straight. Racists are trolling and review bombing the Rings of Power, but they like House of the Dragon, and they'll continue to attempt to revise Tolkien. He was creating a history, a myth, um, a mythology for England, he called it. And um, that involved not just a story, it involved geography, cartography, geology, ethnography, any other ography you like. Um, he had to do it all. And he did. Bottom line is The Rings of Power is just a bad TV show. It's a poorly produced piece of content with no heart or soul, filled with repurposed scenes and dialogue. And when they make up their own, it gets worse. It's the antithesis of Tolkien. Reject revisionist Tolkien. Reject modernity. But I will give you this. The C is always right. If you like what you heard, please like, share, and subscribe. If you didn't like what you heard, I thank you for listening this long. I will see you in the next video. Nerderotic.com. into the fire! Destroy it!